and Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, named for him, which he readily attributes to the people and teams that accomplished the missions day in and day out. Always ready, always there. Receiving the Monmouth School System and the Monmouth College Alumni Outstanding Achievement Awards are in the most visible place in his office at his home in Scottsdale. He is married to Ellen Davis of Scottsdale, Arizona, and they have two children and four grandchildren, one who just got married. His presentation will be some highlights from his career to include the importance of the Air National of the National Guard today to our national defense strategy and the safety and security of community, state, and nation. Hopefully there will be time for questions. Please join me in welcoming Phil Kinney. Thank you, Jane. Uh, after that introduction, She's given most of my presentation. <laughs> I think I'm ready to open it up to Q&A. Uh, the committee that uh, for the class of 63, Dave Arnold, uh, Dean Lawson, and Dawson, excuse me, and Holly Lemon, uh, along with Kenzie, uh, asked me if I would do this, and uh, that's what brought me back to the only reunion I've uh, come to, even though I've been back to Monmouth College multiple times, as Haley uh, pointed out to me last night. Uh, this is the first reunion I came back to, but I just want to let you know, uh, where's Gene? Oh, there he is over there. Uh, that it's uh, quite an honor and very humbling for you guys to uh, think of me to do this, and I appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to recognize a few people. Ralph Whiteman back there has probably done more for Monmouth College than uh, virtually anybody alive. And I, just, yeah. I, I acknowledge he and his wife, Martha. I don't know, is, is uh, Fred Wackerly in here? about Mark Walker, is he in here? There are two other people that are on the board of trustees that were on our list to attend this. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge my sister that uh, you just heard. Uh, uh, she graduated from Monmouth College in the class of 61, and she still is an active minister over in a town by Galesburg. She lives in Galesburg, Illinois. Uh, thank you for coming. You're uh, welcome. Linda. Uh, you know, uh, in, in my business, hello, doctor. Sorry, Come on in and find a seat anywhere. Uh, I go to a lot of reunions. I can remember 20 years ago about going to what I call the Super Saver Society, uh, which is the F-100 for any of you that know anything about airplanes. Uh, and the reunion was in Las Vegas, and Ellen and I went into this uh, casino where the reunion was, and it was on the second floor. We went up the escalator. And there was a group of older people standing around in a, at a bar right there. And I told Ellen, that, that's not the group, they're too old. So we, <laughs> we walked by and uh, couldn't find another group, walked back again. So I just stood there and looked to see if I recognized anybody. And finally I did, I recognized somebody. And I, we were thinking, my golly, those people look old. <laughs> I, I just want to tell you now, 20 years later, uh, for the class of 63, 68, 73, and 78, you look wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not saying that to be funny. You, you really do. Um, how many in the audience, uh, just raise your hand, I don't know anybody standing has ever, were in the military. I know I had to stand last night. Okay. How many were in the Guard, either Army or Air? Okay. How long were you in? Six, Six years. years. 
Six years? Yeah, six years. And uh, you joined back somewhere right out of college or what? Uh, high school. Okay. So uh, let me just tell, tell no, you now, take that back. The, the Guard is uh, significantly, we were having this conversation last night at dinner, significantly different than it was back when you joined the Guard. Uh, and I'll cover that. I, I wanted to show you a picture of Ellen. Disregard the ugly guy on the right. Uh, uh, because she's not here. And she's my better half for sure. Smarter, better looking. Any way you measure quality, uh, she, uh, she's the best. And as I said last night, she's got a direct line to the Lord as well. I'm, I'm uh, quite proud of her. Uh, that's recently, our 43rd anniversary. We got married in 1980. And uh, that's down in Key West, Florida on the 4th of May, which is our anniversary, 43 years. But we just got back from Cartagena, Colombia where our grandson uh, got married to his fiance. They, she's from Columbia. They live in New York City in Manhattan. But that was, I should have brought some pictures of that. But, uh, you know, when we were down at Key West, she, Ellen said to me, you know, you look nothing like the steely-eyed fighter pilot you were when we got married. Uh, <laughs> When, when we get back, I want you to take a DNA test to make sure. <laughs> and that, that re reminds me, you know, I was registered to stay where most of you are staying at Bowers Hall, but I got here uh, a night early and it wasn't open yet, so I ended up staying at the American Inn, and I'm, I'm still there. I, just, I didn't want to pack up and move out. But when I registered, they gave me a picture that you all got on the doors of yourself. It wasn't me. <laughs> and so that really got me to wonder, you know. And I looked at that picture and I told them, that's, that's not me. Uh, and it was Dave Campbell. Oh, is, yeah. is Kenzie here? <laughs> She's not here. Anyway, Dave was a Theta Chi, I think it was a year or two older than us, uh, but uh, that, that goes hand in hand what my wife said with him. Uh, let me give you a, a, a bit of an overview of, of my career. You may wonder why I decided to fly in the Air Force, and particularly fighters. I don't really have there was nobody in our family that uh, had that background. I can remember my dad uh, paying for me to have a ride in a, a Stearman open cockpit, Stearman, and uh, some guy did some aerobatics. I absolutely loved that. And so I, that's as close as I can attribute to being got given the bug to fly fighters until I got to college, and uh, there was a fraternity brother, uh, Dean and myself, named Jim Hubanks, who used to date my sister. And uh, he was two years older, and he went Navy, who fighters in the Navy. And he'd send me postcards routinely, and uh, he always closed with, Go Navy, go Navy. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, I, uh, when it came time to uh, apply for pilot training, I applied for both and got accepted by both. But my dad kind of taught me, always keep your options open. So I, I did, and I interviewed for other jobs. And I can remember being out in New York, uh, New York City, I had an interview with Union Carbide, and uh, uh, one, afterwards I drove by Republic Aircraft, who built the F-105 
Thunder Chief. Uh, that was a backbone of flying in Vietnam. Uh, and four of them were taking off, and that did it. Four in formation, two at a time. And that made my mind up to go Air Force. So uh, from that point on, I, I went Air Force. Uh, obviously, there was no ROTC here at Monmouth, so I had to get commissioned at OTS, Officer Training School, down at uh, uh, San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base. And when I graduated, and got pinned, my uncle, Uncle Glenn, who was my dad's youngest brother, who had a career in the Army, retired as a colonel, he was in the uh, Medical Corps, he, he was in the Korean War, and if you, for those of you that remember much about the Korean War, when the, we pushed way north up to the Chinese border, the 8th Army, he was in the 8th Army, and then the hordes of Chinese came across. His company got wiped out, everybody in the company, and he was listed as missing. And he came walking out, and he had frostbite on his knees from trying to save fellow soldiers in the Army. But he put on his dress greens then, and uh, he was my first salute uh, when I got commissioned. Uh, that's a picture when I got my wings. I went to pilot training at Reese uh, Air Force Base, and uh, that became my first real challenge. I got sick in the first six flights. Uh, I get air sick. <laughs> have, to, have to use the little bag. And in fact, they were getting ready to wash me out because I couldn't get over air sickness. So that's, uh, you know, it all starts with attitude. And that's when I got my first real attitude check by uh, that night before, just standing there looking in the mirror, talking to myself. If they can do it, I can do it standing on my head. And uh, of course, uh, I don't have a direct line to the Lord the way my wife does, but I certainly know how to pray, and I did a lot of that. Anyway, I got through that next flight, and uh, I did very well in pilot training, and I ended up uh, in a F-4 assignment out of pilot training. But when I got sick, they, they decided to switch IPs, instructor pilots, and uh, that instructor pilot, we hit it off. And that's, that's the other reason I uh, got over the hump and made it through pilot training. And he ended up being a four-star commander of Pacific Air Forces. And uh, we used to call him the Marlboro Man because he looked, if you remember that poster board of the Marlboro Man, he looked just like that. And he, uh, he smoked Marlboros too. <laughs> but uh, he was a, a great leader, and uh, sorry to say he's no longer with us. From uh, pilot training, I uh, went to check out the F 4 at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in uh, Arizona. I'll just note one thing there the wing DO, director of operation, was a guy named Chappie James. And uh, I don't know if any of you heard of Chappie, but Chappie's a, excuse me, I don't have a cold. I have surgery on my nose and it's still weak, so I mean, so that's it. But Chappie uh, is the first black officer that made four-star general. And uh, he was commander of NORAD, North America NORAD region. Uh, and uh, he had a son named Danny, who he and I became very close friends. He was director of the Air Guard after me, well, about four times. Danny also passed away with 
from the same thing that his dad did. Uh, from from uh, my checkout in F-4s, I went to Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, in the 40th TAC Fighter Squadron, which is made up of half F-102 air defense guys, and the other half were F-100 tactical fighter pilots. And getting that blend together, working, we had two years. We trained and we got to know each other very well. In fact, we literally <coughs> didn't go home after flying until nine o'clock, and that wasn't hanging around the, the squatter bar drinking either. We were uh, reflying missions and relearning uh, things, getting better, getting smarter, because we knew we were going to deploy to combat. And, uh, we deployed 20 brand new F-4Ds made by McDonnell Douglas uh, over to Thailand. And uh, that was the eighth TAC fighter wing you heard Jeannie announce uh, in my introduction. The eighth TAC fighter wing Wolf Pack in the triple nickel 555 TAC fighter squadron. And our mission was, the, the campaign then was Rolling Thunder. And uh, the missions were North Vietnam. We'd go mainly up around the Hanoi area, uh, interdict uh, key targets in that area uh, was our mission. And, and the F-4 either flew escort over the 105s or we also uh, were loaded with bombs as well, so we could fly either or mission. The F-4 was the most uh, uh, flexible aircraft during that time frame. Uh, my commander was that guy, uh, Robin Olds. Who, who here, anybody heard of Robin Olds? Anybody read his book that his daughter put together for him with his memoirs? Uh, here it is, right here. If you really want to read a good book, that is well written. Robin didn't write it because he died before he could get it written, but <clears throat> it's his memoirs that his daughter put together in the book. Uh, I call Robin the greatest combat leader of men that certainly I've ever met, and I'm not the only guy that says that. About anybody that flew with him acknowledges Robin Olds as the as as the best when it uh, comes to that. Uh, back to the mission. We would fly in strike packages, about 60 airplanes, half of us F-105 Thunder Chiefs I told you about, and the other half were F-4s. We flew out of Thailand um, because of rules of engagement then, you couldn't fly North Vietnam and be based in South Vietnam. So those that flew north, which was the most heavily defended area probably ever, uh, flew out of Thailand. And they're about three hour missions, and uh, that was a normal mission. If you lost somebody, you may end up flying five or six hours because you try to locate that person and get rescue airplanes in. Uh, helicopters, Jolly Green to rescue it. Uh, but when Robin Olds was the leader of the strike force, it, everybody felt better because they knew they had the right leader out there leading the pack. And uh, he gave you more confidence. And of course, you all know with more confidence, that builds competence. And in that business, that made you more lethal. And so uh, that's why I call him uh, the greatest uh, combat leader I've ever known. Combat flying is uh, uh, the biggest challenge, certainly, that I've had in, in my life. I, th I think depending on your occupations, I, I would tell you flying combat, the F-4 was extension of my hand. I felt like I could do anything with that airplane. It uh, amplified all your senses. You could see better, you could hear better. Every, uh, you're, because of the adrenaline pumping, uh, you, could, you could do everything better. Uh, it, 
it just required total focus. And I've talked to surgeons that have operated on me, uh, and they had that same sense. Uh, you know, Vietnam, it was not called a war, it was a conflict. We never declared war in Vietnam, and that was for a reason. We went to war in Vietnam to keep communism from spreading throughout Southeast Asia. But uh, we did not want to escalate the war to the point where China and or Russia would also get engaged in the war, although they were engaged just like we are now in Ukraine. They were back then with uh, Vietnam uh, su with supplies and even <coughs> providing pilots at times for the uh, North Vietnamese. So that's, uh, that's the reason it wasn't uh, declared a war, it was called a conflict. And when uh, LBJ decided that he'd had enough and didn't run again, and uh, Richard Nixon was elected president, if you recall, he changed the focus. Um, in the early 70s, we had the campaign we flew then. I wasn't there then, but the campaign we flew then was called Linebacker 2. And we we sent everything north to include B-52 bombers. We virtually leveled everything up there. And the, the peace accords, remember the Paris peace accords? We, uh, we had the North Vietnamese leadership ready to sign the Paris Peace Accords. Uh, and then that's when Nixon resigned, they, they were ready. But that's when Congress defunded the war, the effort, the conflict. And we walked away. And of course, uh, you remember certainly the helicopter scene in Saigon lifting people off the embassy down there, but it was, it was too late uh, because the American populace was no longer supporting in any way of that war. Uh, from from uh, UBOM, where I was assigned, I then went to George Air Force Base in California where I was an instructor in F-4s and uh, mission was to train guys in F-4s, not only to check them out, but to train them to fly combat in Vietnam. I was looking for a second tour to go back to Vietnam, but I was more valuable as an IP training guys to go over. So I got frustrated and I started interviewing airlines and I went, I accepted a job with Northwest Airlines headquartered in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, after six months of flying with Northwest, I scratched my head and I said, I gave up flying fighters to do this. <laughs> and uh, my recovery, let me catch up a little bit here. I haven't been showing. That's a fully loaded F-4 ready to, ready to do its business. Uh, that's a pre strike air refueling mission. On those three hour missions I mentioned, we did a pre-strike where we topped off so we'd have full gas going into the target area. And uh, then we did a post-strike refueling as well to have enough gas to get home. Uh, that's four F-4s in the break to land at uh, U-Bahn. And it, all the ground crew people were on the ground watching. And what they're doing is counting airplanes to see how many you lost. And uh, I will tell you, my squadron, <coughs> uh, Triple Nickel, we, we took 20 brand new F-4Ds over there. When I left, we had lost 12 airplanes and 17 pilots, of which were either killed or POWs. And so 
the ground crew, it was very important to count airplanes when you came back home. Uh, now I'm, let me get back to where I was. South, I, <coughs> South Dakota Air Guard was my recovery. I met a pilot at Northwest who also flew with the South Dakota Air Guard, and he told me about it. He said, why don't you come down and join the South Dakota Air Guard, which was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And of course, we were living stationed in Minneapolis. And so I did. And I knew that much about the Air National Guard or the National Guard. I didn't know anything about it. And that was to learn about an Air National Guard unit. I picked the right one, uh, South Dakota Air National Guard. Uh, that gentleman right there. He found that those two guys right there founded the South Dakota Air Guard. Uh, the first one is Joe Foss. Any of you remember that name? Uh, Joe is a legend. He was a true American hero. Uh, he flew in World War II. He's from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, farm boy. Uh, when the war broke out, he joined the Marine Corps. He uh, ended up flying Wildcats, which was a mediocre Navy fighter. <coughs> he was getting older by that time. But Joe ended up in the Pacific, the Sol Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, Anderson Field. At 25 years old, he was a squadron commander. And that had a lot of young guys. In three months period, Joe shot down 26 Jap Zeros. And, uh, subtract three weeks from that because Joe came down with malaria and was in the hospital. After three months, Eleanor Roosevelt told uh, her husband, FDR, we got to bring that boy home. Uh, we can't afford to let him get killed. We need to sell war bonds. And so heels dragging, he, uh, he came home. Our leading ace in World War II was a guy named Howard Bong. Uh, he had 40 kills in the Pacific, but he did that over a two-year period. If Joe would have been there two years and hadn't got killed, <coughs> he would far have far exceeded that, that 40 kills. The other guy that was the founder, that guy, his name's Duke Corning. I'm not going to go down the list, but uh, Duke flew B-24s in Europe. Uh, Pulaski oil raids is one of those. I will go, this guy, he also flew in World War II. He was a P-47 pilot in Europe. And he was also an ace. The other two gentlemen uh, uh, weren't in World War II. Of course, that guy on the end, whoops, well, I'm back to where I was. That's me. That's before I was commander, one of the guys, uh, that's the order of, of the commanders up to me, was guessing that I would be the next commander. So at a function we had that we were all at, he got us together and took a picture because he wanted to have a picture of uh, all the commanders of the South Dakota Air National Guard. Uh, while I was in the Guard at Sioux Falls, I had the opportunity to go to fighter weapons school and uh, so you know what fighter weapons school is. How many of you saw Top Gun Maverick? Oh, everybody did. I know you did. I, I, I've, I've seen it maybe five or six times now. But uh, that's, that's what fighter weapons school is. The Navy started fighter weapons school because of Vietnam. And they, they ended up calling it Top Gun. But the Air Force developed their, their schools are virtually the same. You end up becoming a total expert in the field. Kind of kind of like, I won't say getting your doctor's degree, but getting an advanced degree in flying fighters. Uh, so I, and my, my whole focus when I came back from fighter weapons school was readiness. I wanted to do everything I could to make that unit as ready as they possibly could be for uh, conflict. And back then, the 
Guard was the primary combat strategic reserve. In other words, uh, they would only be used, they'd call them up if, if the war got big enough that they need, needed to call up the Air National Guard and the reserve. So but that changed. Uh, so I, I, I did everything I could to make that unit as ready as possible. Now, I, I think I developed the most aggressive, realistic, uh, training the way you're going to fight uh, training program, certainly in the Air National Guard, and rivaled anything the Air Force had. Some of it was so advanced that I'd have to go to headquarters, uh, either Tactical Air Command or certainly the National Guard Bureau, and brief it and get their sanction to be able to do it. And uh, as a result of that, I, I got to know a lot of the leadership in those headquarters areas. In fact, on one of the things I put together, I had to go to the air staff, uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force's staff to get it sanctioned to be able to do it. So, uh, as a result, the South Dakota Air National Guard ended up with a record of excellence unparalleled. And I would tell you, I, as, as best I can tell, it's still that way today. Uh, I became Adjutant General. I was Commander Air Guard there in Sioux Falls for four years, and then the governor of South Dakota appointed me adjutant general over Army and Air National Guard. And uh, I had, uh, there were 17 applicants for the job, and I was the only Air Force or blue suit guy, the rest were Army, of which uh, those that met the criteria or qualifications, there were maybe six total but uh, the governor ended up selecting me, so I had to, I became purple. Uh, I had to learn to speak Army. I had to learn the mission. And I put a full court press on doing just that because the thing I had to do the most was gain the trust of those Army people. And uh, for those of you that don't, know what the Guard is. It's made up, the Army National Guard is made up 75% of traditional Guard people, citizen soldiers that have civilian jobs uh, as well as uh, being in the Guard. And back during that time, you could say they did drill one weekend a month and had two weeks annual training a year for 39 days. Uh, and maybe a little bit more than that, but that was about it. But that's not the way it is today. Um, after a year and a half, the director of the Air National Guard position came open, and uh, the director at the time uh, was somewhat recruiting me to throw my hat in the ring for the position. So I went to the governor and told him, a, uh, the director of the Air Guard position is coming open, and that that position is over all the Air National Guard in the country. And uh, uh, they're asking me to throw my hat in ring for that. I've only been with you a year and a half. It's up to you, Governor. You have to nominate me. He said, well, that's good for you, isn't it, Phil? And I said, yes, sir. Uh, he said, it'd be good for South Dakota, wouldn't it? And I said, absolutely. He said, it'd be good for the Air National Guard and the Air Force overall, wouldn't it? And I said, I think so. I hope so. And he said, well, let's do it. And uh, I ended up uh, being selected by the Secretary of the Air Force as the uh, Director of the Air National Guard. And that was in 1988. A few highlights I'd point out from uh, being director. Uh, that was a dynamic time, if you recall. Uh, the first Gulf War, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, was during that time frame. The 
Cold War ended during that time frame. Uh, uh, remember, during the Vietnam time frame, uh, the Guard, both Army and Air, was a strategic reserve force. And the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird at the time, uh, came up with the total force concept. And that basically said, if we're going to go to war, we're going to mobilize the National Guard and the Reserve. And the Guard was the primary combat reserve force, strategic reserve force. But from here on out, we're going to do that. Because when you mobilize the Guard, you're basically mobilizing America. And if you remember Vietnam, America was not behind that war. So, uh, when Desert Shield broke out, I picked up the phone and called the commander of Tactical Air Command, a guy named Bob Russ, who was somewhat of a mentor of mine and someone I had got to know fairly well. I said, General Russ, if we're ever going to validate total force, now's the time to do it. How about getting some guard fighters in the fray over there? He said, okay, Phil. Tell me who you'd send, and I'll get a hold of the Air Component Commander, who was a guy named Chuck Horner, who I also know pretty well. And meanwhile, you can put a group together and go out and check those units you're recommending and tell me if they're ready, and if they're not what they need to be ready. And I did that, and we were, we were pretty ready. And uh, uh, they also, did the same with the Air Force Reserve. So I would tell you that was kind of the start of how the Guard uh, went from being a primary combat strategic reserve force to an operational force that uh, it is today. keeping up on my slide. That's a picture of my, uh, that I took uh, with a 2 cd A7 and photographer in the back seat over Mount Rushmore. That's precision formation flying, let me tell you. Uh, that's what South Dakota flies now. Notice on the tail, that's a, a wolf. They're called the Lobos. That's, Lobos is Spanish for wolf. My combat unit was the 8th TAC Fighter Wing Wolf Pack. My Air National Guard unit that I flew with uh, were the Lobos. That's the, uh, head, the operations building uh, where I spent most of my time uh, while I was in the South Dakota Air National Guard in that building uh, devising realistic, train the way you're going to fight tactics. That's Bob Russ, the guy I called up and said, General Russ, if we're ever going to validate total force, now's the time to do it. That's not the conversation, but I just wanted to show you this picture. The Cold War ended uh, during that time frame. If you remember when uh, Reagan said to Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, that was in the fall of 89. Uh, the Cold War really ended sometime after that, uh, and uh, we started restructuring our entire military. We brought forces home uh, from all over the world. Uh, certainly the Air Force did, and, uh, and, and General Russ <laughs> then called me and said, Phil, I'd like to put First Air Force totally in the Air National Guard. First Air Force is responsible for air sovereignty, air defense of the United States. Uh, the units that set alert, most of them were already in the Air National Guard. But the command and control, the headquarters, the sectors in the country was divided in four sectors that uh, had radars and were basically the, the controlling entity that controlled the fighters that scrambled, uh, they wanted to convert all that to 
to the Air National Guard. And uh, I agree that it was the right thing to do, particularly then as we were restructuring uh, the Air Force and the Air National Guard. So uh, uh, we did that. And shortly after that happened, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force asked me if I would be the first Air National Guard commander to go down and command First Air Force, which was an active duty numbered Air Force that came under uh, Tactical Air Command. First Air Force was at Tyndall. Uh, and I'm the first person that ended up being down there. I put together a transition team, but all of uh, First Air Force headquarters and the people down there and, and in the four sectors around the country were all active duty. So kind of like being a uh, Adjutant General, I had to gain their trust too that this guard guy, general officer, could do the mission, could be the leader of uh, air sovereignty, air defense for the United States of America. And uh, uh, I did just that. And I would tell you, if it hadn't been for that active duty mentality of really leaning forward, that conversion would not have uh, taken place. Of course, the, uh, uh, the mission, the conversion mission was to be able to convert that headquarters, the sectors, uh, all the uh, units sitting alert, of which most were guard. We had to do a conversion all the while doing the mission, maintaining 24-7, 365 air sovereignty, air defense alert. Uh, no more than completing that transition, conversion, uh, to the Air National Guard, uh, the Air Force decided they want to consolidate some of the numbered Air Forces. So and they wanted to consolidate First Air Force into one of the other numbered Air Forces and let that numbered Air Force do the Air Sovereignty Air Defense mission as well. So I ended up having to defend keeping First Air Force with the Air National Guard. And I can, I, I put a briefing together, briefed the uh, Tactical Air Command, briefed NORAD, uh, briefed uh, the Air Staff, and uh, finally after about a year of, of, of briefings, I was able to win that battle and we kept First Air Force as a, a, a numbered Air Force in the Air National Guard. Towards the end of my tour as commander of First Air Force, General Ron Fogelman, who was Chief of Staff of the Air Force at the time, uh, put together a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the United States Air Force. And it was a big deal. It was out in Las Vegas, Nellis Air Force Base, and uh, it was headquartered in one of the uh, resorts in town. And uh, General Fogelman <coughs> called me and asked me if I would be the escort slash sponsor of the Chief of Staff of the Russian Air Force. We had 80 Chiefs of Staff of Air Forces around the world that came to uh, our anniversary. and. Uh, this is the first time a Russian chief of staff had been in the United States. And it, it, was, it was a big uh, get together. And they had different panels. We had two days of discussions and talking world events, et cetera. But that's General Denyankin. And he was not on the agenda anywhere. Wasn't on a panel, wasn't on. So I went to General Fogelman and I said, you know, General Dinyankin uh, would like to be able to say something to, to the other chiefs, and, uh, but you don't have him on the docket. Is there any way we can get him? He said, all right, Phil, I'll give him 15 minutes out of my time, but make sure he doesn't run over. <laughs> I, I confiscated a, a couple 
Russian-speaking Air Force guys uh, that were at the conference and uh, assigned him to assign them to Ben Yankin. And uh, anyway, they worked with him. And he spoke for 15 minutes. He didn't run over. He was absolutely outstanding. He had humor. He, he, he talked directly at them and got a standing ovation. So, and I would tell you, he was the kind of guy that could make the transition from the Soviet Union to Russia and do it effectively. I regret to say that I have lost contact with him. I, I don't know if he's still alive or not, uh, but that was quite the experience for me. Uh, after uh, my tour at First Air Force, uh, I went back with Adjutant General in South Dakota again a second time. I'm not going to go into that. And then I retired and uh, I had a consulting business for 15 years. Uh, I would still be consulting, but I had some health issues that uh, I came up with, so I ended up uh, dropping my uh, consulting business. I'd like to go uh, a little bit further into the Guard. This is the current leadership of the Air National Guard. This guy, oops, excuse me. That guy right there, uh, Mike Lowe. His dad retired as a four star, was commander of Tactical Air Command, also vice commander of the United States Air Force. Was in the first squadron I was in in the United States Air Force before I flew to combat. And, uh, now, his son, at the time, when, when uh, I was in my first squadron, he was about two or three years old. <laughs> and now he is the director of the Air National Guard, and he's got his hat in the ring to be the chief of the National Guard Bureau, which today is a four-star and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That is an F-35 that belongs to the Vermont Air National Guard, and that boom refueling it is a KC-46 that belongs to the New Hampshire uh, Air National Guard. So we have uh, concurrent modernization with the uh, United States Air Force. That is the uh, little history of the National Guard overall. All right. Messing up my pointer. The Guard is the oldest component of the United States military by far. That's uh, 1636, the first muster of Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, uh, back when they were the militia. And uh, that time frame there, the militia got more and more organized till in 1903, the TIC Act allowed the President of the United States to mobilize the National Guard if needed. I talked to you about the, uh, the Vietnam War and uh, the fact that during that time frame, the Guard was the primary combat strategic reserve and Desert Storm 1991 is when we really got the Guard, uh, particularly the Air National Guard, involved in an operational sense uh, with the United States Air Force. In 2012, there was the Empowerment Act. The Empowerment Act, because the Guard was so much involved, so integral and essential to the United States Army and Air Force, that the, they created the Empowerment Act, which made the Chief of the National Guard Bureau a four-star, and it also made the director of their National Guard, the commander of First Air Force, three stars, uh, which when I was at, they were two-star position. The Guard is the only component that has that dual mission concept. Uh, the state
the state mission, the governor is the commander in chief. And of course, the state mission you're familiar with, and he does that through the adjutant general, uh, is responding to emergencies and disasters, uh, uh, other type of uh, situations in the state that they need the National Guard. Uh, on the federal side, the president, of course, is the authority, and he does that through the Secretary of Defense. Uh, you've got the Army side, if the Guard gets mobilized or federalized, the Army National Guard then becomes part of the United States Army, the Air National Guard becomes part of the United States Air Force. Of course, the, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, uh, who's a four-star member of the Joint Chiefs, he's not commander of the National Guard, but he certainly is the principal coordinator, communicator, not only with the uh, Secretary of Defense, but also Congress, and of course the President is the primary coordinator uh, with the governors in the state. If the Guard is mobilized and they, uh, they're usually assigned to a combatant commander, and they would be in federal status, which we call Title X, uh, as a part of that combatant commander's forces. Uh, that kind of shows the pay status. If they're in state active duty under the authority of the governor responding to uh, state emergencies or civil disturbances, most of the time they're paid for by the state. If the state has a, a really bad emergency and they declare uh, state of emergency, then federal dollars will help come in, but they're still under the authority of the state. Of course, when they, during COVID, if you recall, uh, the Guard was heavily utilized in all 50 states uh, throughout. They were the principal coordinator of, of logistics within the state of putting together uh, uh, vaccination sites, etc. Of course, when they're mobilized and federal status, they're under, they're no longer uh, in the, uh, under the authority of the governor. Uh, they're either in the Army or the Air Force doing their mission. That's a uh, day in the National Guard. There's six geographical combatant commanders around the world, and that was a busy day during the pandemic when we had as many as 67,800 uh, Guard people on duty around the world, most of which were in NORTHCOM right here, uh, and the next most amount was in CENTCOM. But we had Guard people around the world uh, doing missions under that <coughs> combatant commander. That's called the uh, National Guard State Partnership Program. Uh, currently today, we have 90 countries that the Guard is partners with. When the Cold War ended and the uh, uh, Eastern Bloc European countries gained their own sovereignty, uh, the Guard units uh, started, we started, this is when I was still in the Pentagon, started developing uh, partnerships with those Eastern Bloc countries, the first being the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, and today, of course, those are the Eastern Bloc countries that we develop partnerships with. And you can see that these are the Pacific countries that we have partnerships with. I would tell you that the ambassadors and those combatant commanders consider the state partnership program their most valuable tool in their toolkit. A prime example of that would be Ukraine. Ukraine has done as well as they've done because the National Guard has trained them. Their state partner is the California National Guard but they have trained with many of the National Guard units and many of our active duty units. The reason Ukraine 
military has done as well as it's done is because they train the way we fight. They don't train the way the Soviet Union or Russia uh, today fights. And uh, that's a result of that. that. Since that slide was made, we've added uh, three more countries to that. Um, I'll skip that slide. How do we look to the nation? Uh, we're we're uh, readily dispersed. That's the Air National Guard in, uh, uh, I think, 89 communities uh, across the country. And if you overlay that with the Army National Guard, the National Guard is in every zip code in America. And uh, so, I like to say, when you mobilize the Guard, you mobilize America, and that's the reason why. And the fact that we're totally essential in every mission area, of particularly the United States Air Force, to include cyber, to include space, to include artificial intelligence, any mission area that the National Guard has, uh, Air National Guard has, I mean, the United States Air Force has, the Air National Guard also has. Capability to cost. Uh, clearly, uh, you can see up here, it says, uh, we operate 38% of the Air Force wings, 21% uh, of their personnel, and 10% of the budget. The Army National Guard is even more cost effective than that. If you that's the footprint of Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina, which has 72 uh, F-16s. You can put 16 Air National Guard units in that same footprint that uh, Shaw Air Force Base is in that have a total of 299 airplanes. So uh, the guard, the primary reason the guard is more cost effective is the personnel cost. The fact that uh, close to 75% of the personnel are traditional soldiers uh, that not only uh, are trained and inspected to the degree that the active component is, they also bring the skills with them of their civilian occupation. Back today, of course, uh, you all know that is our, what we call our pacing challenge, of which I would tell you we're being outpaced uh, readily right now. Uh, China is totally focused on overtaking the United States, uh, reestablishing a new world order. <coughs> Uh, where the dollar isn't the world currency any longer. They have a goal of 2049 of making that happen. They've accelerated that up now to uh, within the decade. I would tell you they've accelerated that up to 2025. Uh, to give you an idea, their industrial base produces seven ships to R1 Airplane-wise, uh, they produce more than that, significantly more than that. Of course, they either copied or stole all our technology while after 9-11, uh, we were totally focused on the war on terror. They were totally focused on taking over us, as was <coughs> Russia to a degree, but certainly not to the degree uh, that the Soviet Union or that China read that last statement down there. Uh, if we're unable to gain uh, sustained technology overmatch project power and maintain a ready force, we will lose to China. And when you look at high tech, in 40, 44 areas, they're leading us now in 37 of those 44 areas. So that's 
we really need to pay attention on that. That's in 1999, if you look at their military expansion or their ability to project power, just looking at their uh, primarily air and maritime forces compared to our forces in that area of responsibility. That's not our total forces. That's just the Pacific forces. Uh, we still were an overmatch to them. But looking forward, that's last year. And But those forces on our side are an alliance between Australia, Japan, and South Korea. And I, if you can read the what each of these symbols stand for, the airplanes each stand for 25 airplanes, the ships each stand for two except for carriers, it's a one for one on the carriers. There is 2025 when I think uh, we need to be really paying attention to. Uh, you can see they're already up to four carriers. We've got that one carrier that we're showing right there is only in that AOR. We've got 11 carriers. We we can put three or four in there if we need to. Uh, but we are overmatched in power projection in 2025 to the Chinese. Uh, Colin Powell, he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when I was director of their National Guard. I consider him one of those outstanding leaders of all times. And uh, he did it right. Obviously, you set the example. And attitude is everything. Every meeting I was at, he came into that meeting with the right positive attitude. He was a kind of a leader that was likable, approachable, and the troops would come to him with their problems. When I say the troops, I'm talking obviously other general officers, but even down into the enlisted force. That's our national defense today. Uh, to, to put it in short terms, it's to uh, the defense of the United States is number one. Defend, deter, or defeat is our Defend the United States, deter any aggression, uh, big or small, and if we can't deter it, then defeat. That's the national uh, defense strategy. Up until a few years back when we changed it to that, it used to be to be able to uh, uh, fight and win two major regional contingencies within the world, those being China and Russia, to fight and win both of those and hold a third one at bay until you defeated one of the first two and then swing forces to that to defeat it. Obviously, we're no longer capable of doing that, not because we've gotten weaker, it's because others have gotten stronger. I've ran over time. Um, that is, when I was first Air Force Commander, that wasn't the headquarters. Uh, and that wasn't, when I was first Air Force Commander, I wore two hats, first Air Force hat and my CONAR hat. CONAR standing for Continental United States NORAD Region. And with that, Conar hat on, I came under NORAD. That was the operational mission of Air Sovereignty Air Defense of the United States. With my first Air Force hat on, that was to organize, train, and equip forces to do that operational mission. Today, that first Air Force commander wears four hats. Those two that I wore, plus he also wears the AF North hat. Uh, you remember after 9-11, we created the Department of Homeland Security. We also created uh, Northern Command, 
which is a geographical combatant commander. So he is a Air Force provider to the NORTHCOM commander. And he also wears an AF Space Command. Remember, remember when President Trump was president, he created United States Space Command. Well, First Air Force provides the Air Force forces to that Air Force, or to the United States Space Command. That is the uh, new First Air Force headquarters building. Those are, that's an F, darn it. F-16, F-15, those are the Air National Guard fighters that sit alert in 14 locations around the country. And the number of locations varies. Uh, it'll be up to 16 at times, uh, but they're all Air National Guard bases. When the balloon, the infamous <coughs> balloon flew over the country, uh, obviously that uh, they were shot down by an F-22 that came out of Langley Air Force Base. That was probably a F-22 sitting out air sovereignty air defense alert. Uh, 2009 was a special year for me. I, that's the year I got a kidney transplant. Uh, I lost my kidneys to cancer previously, and I was able to get a kidney transplant in 2009. And uh, they also named that building after me. And I would tell you they did that because of the people and teams that made that mission happen day in and day out. And also in Sioux Falls, they named that operations building after me as well, which is to have buildings named after you when you're still alive is uh, more than humbling, let me say. I, the reason they did it, they didn't think I was gonna make it. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna go over the summary, I've told you uh, how the Guard, both Army and Air, change now. They're absolutely essential to everything we do in our military today. We cannot go to war without the National Guard, period. Uh, whatever we do militarily, the Guard will be involved in it one way or the other. Where's my technology? How do I play the video? Anyway, it is General Dan Hokinson, who is the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, uh, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, telling you in less than two minutes what it took me over an hour to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, any cues, any questions? We want to make sure that everybody can get to lunch in a timely fashion. So I, I hate to, I hate to wrap it up, but I think we may have to just make yeah. sure everybody gets fed. That's important. Yeah. We do have golf carts outside. So. He hasn't got to figure out.